Hi, and welcome. This update video focuses on cross number 11. Despite multiple broods and a little over two month old fry, fully matured colors aren't visible yet. However, two males are close and showing promising signs of the snow white phenotype. For new viewers, my name is Ivan. My goal is to establish a stable snow white guppy line by starting with a single snow white male and four females with random colors. I've been systematically breeding them and their offspring to achieve this goal. Cross 11 is a pairing between crosses 5 and 6 and begins my next set of series where I am merging separate lines together. I started cross 11 on June 23rd by breeding my promising male from cross 5 I labeled C5A with three females from cross 6 showing the strongest snow white traits. I'm hoping this cross finally breeds true for snow white offspring. So because I am anticipating this, I decided to cross my C5A male with three females instead of one to increase the number of fry out of this cross. So far, I've had multiple batches of fry born on July 17th, August 13th, August 26th, September 9th, and September 23rd. I used dollar store plastic baskets to help protect the fry from their parents. The oldest batch is a little over two months old, and two of the fry appear to be males. They've been moved to a separate tank, and I'm excited to see that both seem to be developing the Snow White phenotype. At the moment, my predictions seem accurate. The female fry born on the same day as the males reached a point where I feared my C5A male might start breeding with them. Since I had no further plans for my remaining cross eight females, I temporarily moved my C5A male to their tank. Speaking of cross eight, if you are interested in purchasing any of my remaining brood, both male and females, shoot me an email and I'll let you know what's still available. I'm optimistic that cross 11 will yield true breeding snow white offspring. Careful selection and genetic analysis suggest that only the Storzbach gene might be problematic. To express the snow white color, guppies need magenta, blonde based body color, European blau, and Storzbach. The parents for cross 11 are homozygous for blonde based body color and European blau, and possibly heterozygous for Storzbach and magenta. Let's focus on magenta. While I briefly touched on this in the first Cross 11 video, let's delve into some statistics. Assuming magenta is dominant as opposed to incompletely dominant, a guppy with at least one magenta allele will exhibit the magenta phenotype. This means I can't visually determine if a guppy carries one or two dominant magenta alleles. Unfortunately, I'm unsure if the Cross 11 parents are homozygous or heterozygous for magenta but we can do some predictions to help us out. For the first set of calculations, let's assume all parents were heterozygous for magenta. A Punnett square predicts that 25% of the offspring would not inherit the magenta trait. While I'm unsure of the guppy's appearance, it would be an interesting future experiment. But the point is that only a quarter of cross 11 offspring would be non-magenta. Next, Let's assume my C5A male is the only homozygous parent for magenta. A Punnett square with any female indicates that 100% of the offspring will inherit at least one dominant magenta allele, resulting in 100% magenta phenotypes. This would be a good step towards my goal, and there's a 50-50 chance that my C5A male is indeed homozygous for magenta. Now let's again assume my C5A male is heterozygous for magenta. For easier calculations, I've numbered the females one through three and assumed consistent brood sizes. Let's say female one is homozygous for magenta while females two and three are heterozygous. Female one's offspring will all have at least one magenta allele while females two and three should produce 25% non-magenta offspring each. With 20 fry per female, female 2 and female 3 should each produce 5 non-magenta offspring. So, 10 total non-magenta fry out of a total of 60, 
which results in about 17% of the total brood to be non-magenta. Now let's assume that females 1 and 2 are homozygous for magenta. 100% of their offspring would express magenta. Female 3, being heterozygous, could produce 25% non-magenta fry. With 20 fry each, female 3 would likely produce 5 non-magenta fry, making it 5 non-magenta fry out of a total of 60. This results in a little over 8% of the brood potentially lacking magenta. Finally, if all three females were homozygous for magenta, all offspring would express magenta. This would be ideal, making a significant step towards a true breeding line. By ensuring all parents are homozygous for magenta, future generations wouldn't be affected by the recessive allele. Taking all this into account, most offspring from this cross should have consistent phenotypes. The likelihood of non-magenta offspring is between 0 and 25%, which is promising for this cross. Storsbach is different because it's recessive, requiring both alleles for expression. This could hinder phenotype consistency in this cross. I'm confident my C5A male is homozygous for Storsbach, but the female genotypes are uncertain. Ideally, all females are also homozygous for Storsbach, which ensures all offspring inherit the trait. But let's consider all the possible variations. Let's assume that all females are heterozygous for Storsbach. A Punnett square indicates that only 50% of the offspring would express Storsbach. While not ideal for achieving my goal of consistent phenotypes, it's still a possibility. Similar to our magenta analysis, let's assume female 1 is homozygous for Storsbach, while females 2 and 3 are heterozygous. All offspring from female 1 would express Storsbach, while only 50% would from females 2 and 3. With 20 fry each, females 2 and 3 would produce 10 Storsbach expressing fry each. This totals 40 out of 60 fry, or about 67% of the brood expressing Storsbach. If females 1 and 2 are both homozygous for Storsbach, only female 3 could produce non-Storsbach fry, with a 50% chance. Assuming 20 fry each, this would result in 50 Storsbach expressing fry out of 60, making nearly 83% of the brood expressing Storsbach. In summary, most offspring in this cross should express Storsbach. The expected range is 50 to 100%, which is favorable for our goal. Compared to magenta, Storsbach does have a higher impact on the brood's phenotype. I apologize if any of the analysis got confusing, but I hope it goes to show that establishing a true breeding line can sometimes be challenging, especially when using females with unknown genotypes. The fact that there could be two potential genes at play here, although very slim, indicates the brood could have four different phenotypes. Luckily, these phenotypes should largely be dominated by Snow White. We will see how close we get as these fry begin maturing. If you are interested in seeing how Cross 11 will turn out, please consider subscribing. Other interesting crosses are underway, and Cross 13 will be the focus of the next video. I already have some fry from both females I used in this cross. I'm optimistic about the true breeding potential of this cross, but it also has a twist with the gray-based body color influence from the male. Here are a few update clips of my other crosses so far. Cross 10 and 12 have not produced fry yet. Cross 14 dropped its first batch of fry. This one will be an exciting one to follow along and analyze. It'll be more complicated than this 11th cross, but it'll be worth it. Thanks for watching. If you are interested in seeing how and why I set up the pair for this cross and cross 12, check out this video. I go over a little more background and selection processes of the parents. I hope to see you in the next one.